Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another chempilation. So let's get started. We shared a lab with the microbiologist, so we shared a lot of their safety procedures, negative air pressure working environment, etc. One rule was that anything brought into the lab could only leave again if it had been autoclaved. A lot of first years had no idea what an autoclave was, so apparently there were a few cases of people's phones and wallets getting autoclaved. So if you're not sure what an autoclave is, an autoclave is like a high pressure system that's able to steam sterilize stuff. And so you probably don't want to be steam pressure sterilizing your phone and wallet. Understandably, undergrads make mistakes. A couple years ago, I was running a reaction in a 250 gallon reactor. This process involves the hydrolysis of a nitrile group to a carboxylate. At shift change, the reaction was about at temperature and the bubbler was bubbling vigorously. After the handoff, presumably to another operator, I continued to monitor the reaction, and as the bubbling bath in the reactor and in the bubbler would subside, I'd bump up the temperature control unit a couple degrees each time. The long and short of this is the bubbling that I saw in the bubbler was not ammonia byproduct, but house nitrogen providing an inert atmosphere. So basically he's pumping nitrogen in here, so he wasn't actually producing NH3 like he thought he was. Well, as I was looking into the reactor, the whole reaction began to foam. I looked at the pressure gauge, one pound of pressure per square inch, two pounds per square inch, three pounds, etc. And then, boom, the rupture disc went, and I learned what a burp tank was that evening, and how difficult they are to access. My assistant manager told me I made around 1,500 gallons of ammonia, actually 15,000 gallons of ammonia gas, in a few seconds. From then on, I made sure to look over the little things, even the humble N2 needle valve. So the important thing here is, you know, sometimes reactions don't go and then suddenly you cross over a threshold where a ton of stuff happens all at once. And so it's important to do slow additions. In this case, it's on such a big scale that I'm not sure how they really monitor that or uh, make sure that that happens properly. But it's definitely a, a problem that you can solve on a small scale by having good ventilation and sometimes diluting your reagents. So today's Yikes Awardee goes to Craig. Undergrad lab, first day. Inventory your lab glassware. Make a batch of chromic acid cleaning solution. The student behind me got a mouthful of the nasty stuff by sucking it up through the pipette she was cleaning. They sent her hook to the emergency room, and I can't remember the results. We had cotton lab coats and goggles, but no gloves, and that was the extent of safety protocols back then. Yeah, you should definitely not be uh, mouth pipetting stuff, but again, this is 1966, so it makes sense that maybe people weren't as safe back then. While in my NMR saving story, I was the good guy, I also had the chance of being the perpetrator. In my masters, I had to use N-butylithium in hexane for a synthesis. So if you've never worked with N-butylithium before, you can't get it as a pure compound, you can only ever get it as a solution, and usually it's in hexane. This was done in a Schlenk system under argon. This is just like a closed system where you can open and close a certain valve, which is usually called a Schlenk. Um, and when we use the syringe method, of course. One time I was trying to inject the organolithium solution the syringe got stuck, so I pushed a bit harder. This caused the needle to fly away and sprayed a stream of hexane with N-butylithium, oh my goodness, which immediately caught fire. It literally looked like one of those World War II flamethrower footages. Luckily, it was aimed into the fume hood. Unluckily, a colleague of mine was with his head inside the fume hood. Please do not do that, oh my gosh. So yeah, if you're ever working with pyroforks, make sure you respect those around you, oh my goodness. It's usually good to wait till no one else is in the hood. Trying to unlock another part of a setup. Unluckily still, the guy didn't wear safety goggles because he was not doing any reaction. Oh my gosh. The flame passed about two centimeters from his eyes. I nearly crapped myself, and he almost got a heart attack. Very luckily, no one got hurt, and since then, I never saw him in the lab without wearing his safety goggles. Yeah, you know, sometimes people say you can learn from your mistakes, but in this case, fortunately, somebody learned from someone else's mistake. Um, one of the universities where I did research was the university where Neil Bartlett uh, did his work with xenon compounds. And there's the story there that's written down a plaque where Neil's grad student and himself were looking at some crystals of what they believed to be xenon difluoride. And so they took their lab goggles off to take a closer look. Now, if you're not familiar with xenon, xenon is a noble gas and it kind of wants to be xenon, not a complex of xenon, not a salt of xenon. It wants to be xenon. So they went to take a closer look. The reaction exploded, or the crystals exploded, and one of them permanently lost sight in one of their eyes. Um, Neil Bartlett temporarily lost sight in one of his eyes, but eventually recovered his sight. But they never were able to get all of the pieces of glass out of his eyes. And so it's terrifying that you could stick your head into a fume hood without doing a reaction. You know, you're not, you don't have a current setup. You just have clean crystals of product 
and they can all go. And so sometimes if you're working with sensitive compounds, you have to be super duper careful. And in this case, you just maybe don't use n when other people have their head in the fume hood, especially if they're not wearing lab goggles. On the topic of the Yikes Awards, and in solutions of toxic stuff dissolved in chloroalkanes, in undergrad I had some sort of osmium compound dissolved in chloroform in a glass pipette. I think it was preparing a TLC plate or something like that. Anyway, I cringe to even recount this story, but a single drop of it somehow made it onto my left leg. Within a week, a hole opened up in my flesh where the drop had been. This was not good, obviously, and I called poison control sometime later, attempting to clean the wound as best as I could with hydrogen peroxide. It was, it was dumb. After a long silence, the woman came back on the line with a deep sigh and said, Okay, sir, you're going to have to tell me how in the world you possibly came into contact with this stuff, and then proceeded to explain I worked in an inorganic lab and had an accident, yada yada. The wound healed, but there is a bump underneath it that will remain there the rest of my life probably. I've monitored it with a dermatologist, and it hasn't grown in six years, and it doesn't seem to be cancerous. But like, I am begging any young and upcoming chemists reading this, please be careful. Please be more careful than I was, because all this time later, I still spend way too much time worrying about it than I should. This isn't the worst thing that ever happened to anyone working in the lab. My PA at one point recounted a story from a grad student where he had accidentally bumped nickel tetracarbonyl into the lab through a questionably placed vacuum pump. Nickel uh, tetracarbonyl is definitely a dangerous compound. So the takeaway from this is be careful with what you're working with. You know, if you're working with something like osmium compounds, definitely avoid getting it on yourself and deal with it immediately. Don't wait a while. Don't think it's probably going to be okay because sometimes chemicals take a while to do their damage. When I was an undergrad organic chemist, I shared a fume hood with someone working on oxygen-sensitive reactions, so needed to degas some pentane with argon. The reason that argon is used instead of nitrogen is argon is more dense, so it'll displace the headspace of the flask much better, and it'll be better at removing every last bit of a gas. This was done in a CO2 bath under partial vacuum. My friend sealed off the RBF, the round bottom flask, and left it to be used the next day. In the morning, he came over and barely touched the glassware before it exploded and showered the entire lab in tiny shards of glass. Overnight, the temperature of the vessel had obviously increased, and the argon came out of solution. The pressure had built up, and he had created a tiny bomb. He was left with hundreds of bits of glass in his face and blood all over his clothes, but no long-term damage. He also destroyed three months of my research as all other glassware in the fume hood had disintegrated. That's terrifying. That's awful. That's so unfortunate. Here's another story. When I was in university, I was working in shipping and receiving department, driving around a golf cart delivering stuff across campus. Was awesome. This is my favorite story, by the way. We had a box that came in destined for the bio lab, and it had arrived wet. As in, the whole bottom of the box was wet. The box didn't have any markings on it or anything, and we weren't too suspicious of it, so we grabbed it and threw it on the cart to deliver to the bio lab. When we got there, we met the professor and was like, hey, we've got a package for you. No idea what it is or why it's wet, but it arrived like that. And he responded in the most deadpan voice ever, oh yeah, it's a box of dead cats for a dissection lab. To this day, I still have no idea if he was joking or not. And you know, maybe he was joking, maybe he's not. We'll never know whether the cats were dead or alive. All right, I've got one. This comes from my sophomore OCHEM lab. 20 undergrads and our TA collectively get high off solvent vapors. Lab services forgot to turn on the fume hoods that day, and we are refluxing in DCM. This is a friendly reminder for you if you're in a lab right now to check that your fume hood's working. You can just get like a little bit of paper towel or a Kim wipe, tape it onto your fume hood, see if it's getting pulled into the fume hood. If it's not, you should probably call someone. The lab's HVAC was on, so the air was circulating in the room and wasn't immediately obvious that the DCM was slowly building up in the room. Out of the blue, our TA asks, does anyone feel lightheaded? And the class collectively responds, yeah. TA back to the class, okay, yeah, we're going to go get some fresh air. At the time, I didn't personally have much experience huffing solvents. What does that mean? So I didn't quite notice the effects of creeping up on me, attributing them to college sleep deprivation, three-hour afternoon lap tiredness. It was only uh, once I got to fresh air that I realized how loopy I was feeling. Side note, is it just me or does DCM smell minty? I've never seen it described that way. So personally, I can't actually smell DCM or chloroform that strongly. If you think DCM smells minty, make sure you comment down below. One story that gets told to every first semester bachelor student at my university when they start their introductory lab exercise is why they are never allowed to add the diluted potassium cyanide solution for proofing in the presence of copper cations by themselves. Apparently, a few years back, one of the lab tutors was asked by a student to hand out the potassium cyanide solution. It's stored in a locker, so she could perform the mentioned test. 
Of course, in the script, the students were very clearly given. It is stated that the solution had to be alkaline before the addition of the cyanide to prevent the formation of deadly and poisonous hydrogen cyanide gas. The tutor asked the student if they had tested the pH of their solution, which they confirmed. The tutor proceeded to give the student a small bottle of potassium cyanide solution and a pipette, telling them to add a few drops inside of the fume hood. Now I have to add that that fume hoods in our undergrad labs were notoriously unreliable and often have had the warning lights turn on for low flow rate. Most people besides the first semester student know that. The student then added a whole bunch of the cyanide solution to their test tube, which contained the aqueous solution of copper too, but apparently they had not tested the pH because the cyanide was instantly turned into hydrogen cyanide gas. That's awful, oh my gosh. As soon as it was mixed with the acidic solution, which started to fill the malfunctioning fume hood. The student collapsed shortly after and had to be rushed to the nearby hospital where they survived the cyanide poisoning just barely. Oh my goodness, that's crazy. Since then, the tutors add the cyanide themselves after checking the pH again with an indicator strip. Yeah, you know, the alternative solution here is just do a different experiment that doesn't involve cyanide. I don't think that that's a crazy thing to propose. In high school, we were asked to come up with or recreate an experiment. The teacher was concerned over my lab, combustion enthalpies of different primary alcohols, but let another kid burn straight gasoline to measure fuel efficiency. But this was not where it goes wrong. First red flag, the kid shows up with three mason jars and the teacher lets him sit them on the lab bench. Next, this should, should have been a clear stopping indicator. He poured the gas in the alcohol burner and began his experiment. After one trial, the alcohol burner cracked, but it gets better. Since I finished my experiment, I let him use my spirit burner the next day, even after the first burner cracked and the teacher said, it will be fine. However, it was not fine. He lit the flame and five minutes in the glass shattered, also igniting the gasoline all over the fume hood. The teacher, who was at his desk, heard the explosion and rushed over with the fire extinguisher. Luckily, no one was harmed, but I'm still puzzled how that flew over the teacher's head. Yeah, and here's a picture from a member of the Discord who, uh, who actually told this story. Thank you for sharing. In the 80s, they still used dichromic acid to clean glassware, and they left it to a technician to prepare the solution by mixing potassium dichromate with sulfuric acid. It turns out that this particular technician had no chemical background at all and never read further than potassium. So one day, the preparation didn't go as planned because he had taken the bottle of potassium ferrocyanide instead. There are a few cyanide complexes that are soluble in sulfuric acid, but this is one of them. If it had been another one, enough hydrogen cyanide would have been generated to kill everyone in the building. From that day forward, technicians were no longer allowed to make solutions. That is terrifying. They are very lucky that it didn't make cyanide. So this happened only a few months ago. I am in the fourth semester and we were doing our first ever real organic synthesis stuff. So in the third experiment, we were doing a radical chlorination of cyclohexane with sulfuryl chloride and AIBN. AIBN is just a radical initiator to get things going. We had set up a gas trap for the sulfur dioxide and HCl gas that would be created in the reaction. In the preparation with our supervisor, he urged us to use cyclohexane and not cyclohexene or cyclohexanone because the latter one happened once. Fortunately, no one was hurt. And so one of my lab mates went and got the chemicals for us for the reaction. I was the last one to put them in the round bottom flask, so I put in the sulfuryl chloride and I wanted to put in the cyclohexane, but I was short about five milliliters. So I went to the storage room and there was some other students getting their stuff for the same experiment. And so they already had the container open. And so I asked them if it was cyclohexane to which they said, yes, they gave me my five milliliters of quote unquote cyclohexane and went back to the apparatus. I put it in and it immediately started to bubble violently. So I went back to the other students to tell them not to put their stuff in. And the guy just looked kind of scared and told me it was cyclohexane. Yikes, that's awful. In the meantime, my lab mates went and got our supervisor, who put an ice bath underneath the reaction mix to cool it down. We left it stirring there for now, just to react slowly away. It was only like five minutes later when I realized that I'd forgot to turn the valve leading to my water trap, and I'd sealed off the system during all of this, so it's just building pressure. That's not great. And so I turned it, and the trap immediately started bubbling away. I didn't... I think it was only because of the ice bath that it didn't explode from too much pressure. Also, quenching sulfuryl chloride is a real pain because I had to put water and afterwards base in it, but it didn't react at all. So I just dumped it in an Erlenmeyer and it just sat there for like a month until the organic layer was no longer acidic. Yeah, that's scary. I was running a DCM hexanes ethyl acetate column in a non-air conditioned room in a hot summer night and the compressed air blew and the column flew towards my face. The liquid in the reservoir poured over my face and got into my eyes, nose, and mouth. Oh my gosh. 
I noticed that DCM is sweet. On my way to the ER, my friend told me that DCM can dissolve the lens in the eye. My ride back was a Tesla, so that was cool. Oh my gosh, yeah, that is terrifying. Definitely be careful if you're ever working with solvents near their boiling point. If you are working in a lab and it's not air-conditioned, maybe use a different solvent instead of DCM or ether just to avoid any issues. Yikes. Way back in lower division OCHEM, I had water contaminate an out-of-hood reaction containing acetyl chloride. We did most things out of the hoods, despite the, the fact that DCM was used. So this is like an older practice. Now you would only ever use volatile solvents inside of a fume hood. And some universities still haven't done this, but they should. It was a dry tube, so I wasn't thinking of any water contamination when I saw it and felt it start boiling up the tube. While my smooth brain was failing to keep up, my nose discovered what HCL smells like. I say smells like, and it smelled sour, but feels like is a bit more accurate. Imagine all of the hairs in your nose feeling a gentle but significant pulling sensation. Same OCHEM, but different problem. Almost the entire building, including the fume hoods, would shut off at 10 p.m., and my lab ended at 10 p.m. If you ever didn't finish on time, you got gassed by the waste and solvents in the hoods, but it gets worse. The building shutoff time didn't account for daylight savings time, so partway through the course, you needed to start finishing an hour early, otherwise you would get gassed. I have spent a significant amount of time getting gassed in a dark room doing chemistry. Again, this is another really stupid thing. Why not just keep the fume hoods on? It's probably better anyway because people are going to be returning in the morning and it would be nice if the air in that room was breathable because if the fume hoods are off, you could still accumulate toxic gases. If you disagree with me or if you have anything to say, let me know down below. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Kempilation Comments. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed and I hope you have a great day. Which chemicals are the most dangerous? It's me, I am the most dangerous.